right. God bless you, everybody. Welcome back to our weekly Bible study here at Rivers of Living Water International Ministries Church of God in Christ. We're back. It is Wednesday, and we are here again to dive into the Word of God. We are going to get into the Word of God. We are back after an awesome week from our Kingdom Impact Conference of Michigan Southwest Fifth Jurisdiction, of which we are a part, excuse me, of which we are a part um, uh, under our Bishop, Bishop Don W. Shelby Jr. So we are so grateful. It was a wonderful conference, a wonderful time of inspiration and impartation and information. We are so grateful to God for the opportunity to have taken part in that. And now we are back to study the word of God together and to just really get into the word of God, study it out, right? Scripture, verse by verse. So we are thankful for that. Thank God for all of you who are on the line. I'm going to go ahead and share it. Um, I'm asking you to do the same, whether you're viewing by way of Facebook or um, YouTube or Instagram, whatever the case may be. Go ahead and share so that we can get the word out. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and this is part two. Okay. All right. It's like Facebook has changed some things here. So, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and share that. You all, please do the same. And we want to go ahead and get into the word of God. So Lord, we thank you for your goodness tonight. God, we thank you for your kindness toward us. <clears throat> we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. God, we're asking you now to just have your way. Hallelujah. Have your way in this study. Have your way in this place. Have your way over the airways. Have your way over the live stream. Lord God, let your spirit give us wisdom and revelation. Revelation knowledge, Lord God. Give us understanding and illuminate our hearts, oh God. Inspire us, oh God, by your word. Enliven us by your word in the name of Jesus. We give you all the glory, God. You be, you get all the glory. You, you get all the praise. You be honored with this study tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> all right. First Corinthians chapter 11. Last time you were here. And good to see you all on the line. I see my beautiful wife is on the line. Thank God for you. I see Michaela and Andrew Jr. And I want to say... Samuel should be on the line as well. And just get the word out, you all. Let's build up these numbers because I know I am teaching the word of God. And the word of God is what's able to save our souls. Amen. God bless you, Mother Jones. Good to see you on the line tonight. Thank you for your generosity as well. Thank you for the, the cards of encouragement. I have the card right up here. I look at it. See? Look at this. This is from Mother Jones. Thank you so much, Mother Jones. It says, God bless you, Pastor. The Lord has called and gifted you. As you rest in him, he will work. As you trust in his ways, he will bring fruit. As you sow his word, he will give the increase. So I thank God for that. Thank God for you, Mother Jones, for that great encouragement. And all of you who have given us encouragement in this uh, infancy, if you will, this infancy as, as we are uh, growing and as we are planting and sowing seeds of the gospel in the in and around the community and around the world. So we're looking forward to what God is going to do. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So last time in first Corinthians chapter 11, we talked about uh, being imitators of Paul as he was of Christ, right? Following Paul as he followed Christ, which has indication to, you know, in our modern day, you know, following our spiritual leaders, our pastors, bishops, etc., those who have authority over us um, as children, for example, your spiritual authority, if they are saved, are your parents, right? So follow their example as they follow Christ. Okay, we talked about that. We talked about what he means when he's talking about the traditions that he passed on to them, the traditions that he delivered to them. Um, about the, the head coverings, right? That the woman should have a head covering, that the man should not have a head covering when they're praying or prophesying. Um, 
and what that means. And we talked about the principle behind that, right? Which is you want your men to look like men. You want your women to look like women and you never want to be confused, right? About who's who, okay? And so we've talked about that and the nature of that, the principle of that. Um, and he said in verse 16, if anyone is inclined to be contentious or to have a problem with this, he's saying, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. This is the ESV version. So he's saying, this is how um, we've been doing it. This is the tradition, okay? And notice he said, this is the tradition, not the commandment, okay? Meaning traditions can change with time. God's commandments, okay, rightly divided in the word of truth, God's commandments, God's truth, that is the principle of his word, never changes, amen? But traditions can change. All right, traditions can change. So we talked about that and kind of the significance of what that means uh, last time. Now we're gonna talk about the Lord's Supper. All right, so just to give you a little bit of background on this, um, the Lord's Supper, If we, I'm reading in my study Bible in the notes here before we get to the actual scripture, just to give you some context. Um, in, this, in this day and age or in this time frame where when this was written, Okay, by Paul. And, and notice also the letter that was written to the Corinthian church was one of the earliest letters that Paul wrote and one of the earliest um, documents, if you will, of the New Testament. Right. So it was written, some estimate, within 15 years of the events of Calvary and the resurrection. So it was very, very recent to the uh, events that took place um, in the life and times of Jesus Christ. So. Um, it was during this time that when they were to observe the Lord's Supper, the communion that the Lord Jesus instituted, the breaking of the bread and the, the drinking of the fruit of the vine, it was during this time that they would also have what's called an agape feast or a love feast, okay? <clears throat> this was generally done before the communion took place, okay? Um, they were discontinued or actually forbidden at some point because there were so many problems accompanying these feasts is what it's saying here. Um, so they were forbidden um, by AD 397 at the Council of Carthage. All right. So the context here is saying they were going to have, they were having dinners and that type of thing before the Lord's communion, right? As part of the Lord's Supper or preceding the Lord's Supper. So he's saying in verse 17, so follow along. <clears throat> this is the ESV. And I'll also read it in the King James Version um, as, as need be. <clears throat> he says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Okay, he just got done saying, I do commend you with regards to, you know, you're following the traditions that I gave, the traditions of the head coverings and so forth. I commend you in that. But now he says in the following instructions, I do not commend you. I do not praise you. I do not find um, an area of, of praise in this for you. He says, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. It's for the worse. It would not be sad if in church today, when we come together to have fellowship or to have a service or to have an event that it actually hurts people more than helps people. It takes away from people more than builds them up. He says, I do not praise you in this. I do not commend you, okay? It says, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. I would hate to have a spiritual leader tell me, your gatherings are not beneficial is actually hurting people. It's causing people to be hurt, to be angered, um, to cause offense, right? To cause people um, to not even want to come to church. Okay, so we don't want to do that. He says, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you and I believe it in part. Now, he talked about this earlier. If you go back to the earlier chapters where we studied this in January, February timeframe, 
he talked about those divisions, how they were setting up kind of sex among them, right? S-E-C-T-S, right? Like is as in sectional, right? They set up divisions among them. They set up uh, things uh, between them to try to distinguish themselves from one another, to say that I'm special because I follow Apollo, so I'm special because I follow Paul, you know, et cetera, et cetera. He's saying we shouldn't have these divisions. He says, I believe it in part, for there must be factions, differences among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. That is to say, there are some who are disingenuous. There are some who are hypocrites. There are some who are not really true Christians, <clears throat> not truly um, walking in the favor of the Lord. God bless you, Mother Moore. Good to, good to see you on the line tonight on Instagram. God bless you, Mother Nettie Moore. <clears throat> so he's saying there's got to be some differences among you because otherwise you wouldn't be able to tell the real from the fake. OK, it's like Jesus talked about the wheat and the tares. Right. And how somebody was sowing tares among the wheat or among the grain. Right. And, you know, they asked, you know, do you want us to go ahead and get the tares up? And he said, no, let them grow until the end. And then at the end, the angels are going to come and separate the wheat from the tares. Right. Going to separate the tares from the wheat and then bundle up the tares and cast them into the fire. So you don't want to be the tares, you want to be the wheat, okay? This is this is basically alluding to the fact that you want to examine yourself, okay? That's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 through 7, where it says, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, okay? Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Okay? So... You need to test yourself. You need to examine yourself. Are you truly born again? Are you truly putting your faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on the cross for our sins? And yes, all of us have sinned, okay? If you ever told a lie, even a little white lie, if you ever disobeyed your parents, if you ever looked up on someone to lust after them, OK, if you ever looked at the opposite gender, the opposite sex or the same sex, for that matter, to lust after them with the intention of, an, of lusting after them, then the Bible says you've already committed adultery with them in your heart. OK, have you ever been angry with someone without a cause? OK, the Bible equates that with murder. OK, so some of us watching this tonight are murderous, lying adultery, adulterers, and thieves. And so if you had to stand before the Lord on judgment day, based on your own merit, we'd, we'd all be lost. That's why Jesus came, because we couldn't stand the test on our own. We could not pass the test of God's standard on our own. He had to come, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh had to manifest so that we could be free, so that we could be healed, so that we could be delivered, so that we could be forgiven, so that the power of sin could be broken off of us, okay? <clears throat> so he says, examine yourselves, okay? Again, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're just going through verse by verse. We're at verse 19. He says, these factions, these disagreements, these divisions, um, to some extent, they must be there in order to distinguish the real from the fake, the genuine saint from the ain't, <laughs> okay? The, the person who's genuinely put their faith in Christ and those fruits are being shown forth versus the person who's a hypocrite, right? They're doing the right things on the outside, but inwardly, they're unchanged. Inwardly, they have eyes full of adultery and lust. Inwardly, they're they're, you know, selfish and bitter and, and don't want to help people. And, you know, they haven't changed on the inside. Hallelujah. God wants to see us changed on the inside. <clears throat> um, and then the next verse says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Okay. 
they call themselves observing the Lord's Supper, right? Jesus instituted this as an as a ordinance in the church. It's one of the three ordinances. It's communion, baptism, and foot washing. That is, foot washing is where you humble yourself to serve your brother or your sister. Okay, that's the principle behind it. <clears throat> you humble yourself to do that which is most lowly in service. So those are the three ordinances of the church, baptism, baptism in water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, according to what Jesus told us in Matthew 28, but then also communion, okay? Communion is where Jesus instituted the night that he was betrayed, okay? The night that Judas went and betrayed him. That night before that, they had the Lord's Supper, okay? So he's saying what you're doing is not the Lord's Supper. It's not the proper observance in memorial or in remembrance of what Christ has accomplished for us. He says, for in eating, verse 21, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. This is what they were doing, okay? And calling it an agape feast, a love feast, um, calling it the Lord's Supper. And it wasn't. They were getting their own food, bringing their own food from home, okay? And instead, instead of it being a potluck where everybody could share, right? And nobody goes hungry and everybody gets satisfied. One person or one family or individuals were bringing their food from home and feasting <laughs> in front of everybody else who didn't have, okay? Um, it would be like going to a meeting and you bring in your food at a meeting and nobody else has anything to eat and you just chowing down. You're just eating your, eating your donut or whatever it is. And they're looking at you like, wow, how rude, <laughs> right? So, in, so we don't want to do that. That was a bad example. And that's why he was saying, I don't praise you in this. One goes ahead with his own meal. Another goes hungry. Another gets drunk. So they were drinking, okay? They were drinking real wine that could make you drunk. Okay, God bless you, Sister Sherry Harris. Good to see you on the line tonight. They were drinking real wine. Okay, so they were they were getting in trouble. They were disobeying the command of the Lord not to be filled with wine, not to be drunk with wine. They were forsaking that. Okay, so saints of God, we don't get drunk. And saints of God in the church of God in Christ, of which we are a part, we don't believe you should be drinking in the first place. OK, no, there's not a scripture that says emphatically it's a sin to drink, but it is unwise. The Bible talks about how wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Right. And those who are deceived thereby are not wise. So we know that strong drink, wine, beer and all of that can lead to trouble, can lead to problems, can lead to heartache, can lead to bad decision making, can lead to corruption of judgment, okay? That is corruption of discernment. You're not able to discern. That's why you see a drunk man walking down the middle of the street sometimes because he doesn't have enough sense in that stupor and in that mental state that he's in, he doesn't have enough sense to know that he's endangering his life and the life of others, okay? So we teach it's better not to drink in the first place. Just avoid that whole issue, okay? Um, so he says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. He says, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? In other words, are you coming to the church of God to despise it, to, to mock those who don't have what you have? Are you coming to show off? Oh, I have a rack of lamb and I have, you know, ribs and, and uh, rib tips and, uh, and I have, you know, cornbread and greens and muffins and macaroni and cheese and sweet potatoes and candy yams and, you know, fried fish. And you just had this whole feast and your brother's over there, your sister's over there, barely has two crackers. And you just chowing down, not even thinking about them, not even offering them anything. 
That's what was going on here. He says, don't you have a house that you can eat in? Do you have to bring all your food to the church and belittle the one who doesn't have as much as you? He says, what shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. <laughs> so Paul was, was basically getting at them, right? Paul, Paul was chastising them. He says, shall I praise you? And this is what the King James says. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. <laughs> you don't get the gold star for this. You don't get the, you know, good for you sticker. You don't get the golden sticker. You know how we used to get those stickers in elementary school when you did a good job on a spelling test or homework assignment or whatever it was. You would get these stickers and you would look forward to those stickers. You want that, that commendation. You wanted that praise. He's saying, you no gold stickers for you. No cookies for you. You do not get the prize. He says, I will not praise you in this. In other words, he's saying, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Put that into the comments. Say, this is ridiculous. It's ridiculous that you are um, bringing your food and your fermented drink while your brother and sister don't have anything. You're humiliating them. You're not even thinking about them. You're thinking about yourself. It's selfishness at its max extreme. It's ridiculous. Selfishness is ridiculous. Selfishness is the main reason why relationships don't work out, whether it's friendships or marriages or work relationships, boss to um, you know their employee or the report to their boss. Um, it's selfishness that breaks up relationships because selfishness says, I want what I want regardless of what you want. Okay. And so you have this attitude of, you know, I just want to get what I need. What's going to make me happy? What's going to make my life easier? What's going to help me? And if it hurts you in the process, well, that's just a cost of doing business. <laughs> it's ridiculous. That's right. Selfishness is ridiculous. And so, and it manifests itself in so many ways and some sometimes in ways that we're not even aware of. That's why we need to pray. That's why we need to submit our hearts to the Lord. Hallelujah. And he will reveal these things to us so that we will not offend, so that we will not continue to hurt our brothers and our sisters. God bless you, Sister Small. It's good to see you on the line tonight. He says, verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. We have to understand that Paul received from Jesus Christ himself directly. OK, Paul, as he as he states in other scriptures, Paul did not consult with Peter and James and John to get this revelation. But what's amazing is when you look at the Gospels written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you look at this account of that night of his betrayal, it's almost word for word what Paul has written here, okay? And so it's amazing the consistency of scripture, okay? So he's saying, I received this revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and I gave this to you. I gave this revelation to you. I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, okay? Jesus knew what he was about to accomplish. He knew that his body was about to be sacrificed. He knew his blood was about to be poured out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so Jesus is saying to Paul uh, on the night he was betrayed, he says in verse 24, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In other words, when you come together, okay, and at this time, as I said before, they were doing what were called a, an agape feast or a love feast, okay, and eventually that was done away with because of all the issues they were having with it. But they weren't coming together recognizing the purpose for it. They were coming together just, you know, having fun, drinking, eating, you know, just eating to their heart's content. Never mind, my brother over here doesn't have to eat. Does, never mind, my sister over here doesn't have enough. 
They're just coming and doing their own thing and not really recognizing that it's about Jesus. Hallelujah. Put that into the comments. Say, it's about Jesus. When we come together as a church, when we fellowship together, when we do anything together, it's about Jesus. Everything you do, as we read in the previous chapter, whatever you do, in word or in deed, let it be to the glory of God. So it's all about Jesus. When you go to work, it's about Jesus. When you go to school, it's about Jesus. Your performance on that exam at school, it's about Jesus. How you prepared and studied for that exam, how you prepared and did your homework, how you were diligent to manage your time, it's about Jesus. How you reacted to your boss on the job, how you treated your reports, your your um, those who report to you on the job, your direct reports, how you treat them, it's about Jesus. How you treat your pastor, how you treat your spouse, how you treat your wife, how you treat your husband, how you treat your children. It's about Jesus. So he's reminding them that as you come together to partake of the Lord's Supper, keep in mind who it's about. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Put your focus on Jesus. Put your attention on Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross, his, his broken body and shed blood that was done for you and for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When I think about what Jesus did for me, thank you, Jesus. When I think about how I don't deserve his goodness, when I think about my mistakes and even things that I did on purpose that I knew were wrong, okay? And we've all done it. We've all done something that we knew was wrong, okay? We did it anyway because whatever pressures or you know peer pressure or just internal pressures whatever it was that caused us to give in to that temptation that disqualifies us right from uh you know being acceptable to God on our own but thank God for Jesus Thank God for his body that was broken for us. Thank God for his blood that was shed for us that makes us acceptable to God in spite of what we've done wrong, in spite of bad decisions, in spite of mistakes, in spite, in spite of, uh, you know, just things that were just mistakes, things that we didn't intend to do, things that we didn't know, okay? But then also those things that we did know. Sins of omission and sins of commission. Sins that we knew were wrong and that we committed and sins that we didn't know were wrong that we committed either by commission or by omission. Okay, the Bible says to him who knows to do good but doesn't do it, to him that's a sin. Okay, so if you know to do well, you know to do what is good and you don't do it, that's a sin. OK, so we've all sinned. Going back to my earlier point, we've all sinned. So we all need the sacrifice that Jesus made available to us. We all need his body to be have, to have been broken on the cross. We all need his blood to have been shed on the cross. We all need the precious lamb of God to take away our sin. OK, we all needed that. Because none of us could be good enough on our own. Even if you got saved at a young age like I did, that did not mean that you did not commit sin before then. Even if you were five, four, three, okay? The Bible makes it clear that we were all born into sin, born with a sinful nature, born with a tendency to sin. Yes, so we all need Jesus, like Lady Moore put on the screen here. We all, we all need Jesus. Put that into the comments. That's good. We all need Jesus. And so he's putting them in remembrance of this and saying, this is my body, which is for you, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way or in the same manner also, he took the cup after supper. Okay, so after they had eaten, he took the cup. And this is what he said. This cup is the new covenant. Hallelujah. Thank God for the new covenant. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Hallelujah. Somebody say, thank God for the blood. 
Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. So he says, do this as oft as you drink it. So he's not he's not laying down a, a law or a rule saying you have to have communion every day or every Sunday or every first Sunday or you know once a year or whatever. He's saying as often as you do it. So how, however often that may be, right? You know, as the Lord leads you, right? Or as your church deems, um, as often as you do it, okay? I know the Catholics, they do it at every mass, right? There's some churches that do it every first Sunday. Some churches do it every second or third Sunday. Some churches do it, you know, every Sunday or just a few times a year. But however many times you do it, keep Jesus in the forefront of it. Keep Jesus as the focus. Why? For verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you show forth, okay, the Lord's death until he comes. You are making a proclamation by doing this. Hallelujah. God bless you. Good to see you on the line on Instagram. You're making a proclamation. You're saying, Jesus made this sacrifice for me. You're declaring emphatically, Jesus did this for me. Hallelujah. It's a proclamation that you're making when you, when you observe the communion, the communion of the Lord's body and blood. Hallelujah. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you do show forth the Lord's death till he come. Okay. He's coming back again. Yes, he has risen from the dead, but he's also coming back again. He's coming back on the clouds. We're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah. And until then, we want to declare, we want to proclaim the Lord's sacrifice for us that he did on the cross. Verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord, and we talked about him in chapter 10, how you're not to take the cup of devils and the cup of the Lord. You're not to eat at the table of devils and the cup of the Lord. Okay. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, okay, he's saying in the way that you have been doing it, right, having these feasts, these agape feasts, right, and not um, looking out for the needs of your brothers or sisters, not discerning that this is the Lord's body, his sacrifice, his re uh, in remembrance of his sacrifice, not having that in mind, right, that's doing it in an unworthy manner. He says, if you do that, you will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. You will be guilty of this. And I don't want to be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, okay? We've already committed enough sins that sent him to the cross. We don't need to add to that, okay? So we don't want to be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. This is why when we take communion, we ask you to examine yourself. Verse number 28, let a person or let a man, a person, a human, Examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Okay, so examine yourself. Examine your motive. Why are you partaking of the communion? Okay, examine your life. Okay, do you have any unconfessed sins? Do you have any grudges, bitterness, unforgiveness, um, sexual immorality, any, any, of, any sin, okay, that you know of that you're not letting go of? I'm not talking about... You know, you hate the sin and you're crying out to God for grace and strength, okay, to walk in victory. But I'm talking about sin that you don't want to give up, a sin that you have not uh, given over to the Lord, okay? It says, let a person examine himself, okay? If you know you are in the bondage of sin, you need to commit that to the Lord. You need to say, Lord, I repent of this. Help me. Give me grace. Uh, give me grace to turn from this, okay? And he will. God will hear your prayer and he will set you free. He will give you victory, okay? But you have to have a heart towards him, okay? I'm not saying you have to be um, this, you know, just perfectly, you've never committed any mistakes, you know, between one Sunday and the next in, in order to take communion. That's not what I'm saying. But you have to have a heart that's tender before the Lord, a heart of surrender, a heart of repentance, true repentance, saying, God, I want you, okay? You are enough. 
You are more important to me than any sin. Okay, and you need to despise the sin. Okay, you need to renounce and denounce the sin. Okay, and let the Lord strengthen you. Okay, so examine yourself. Uh, what is your motive for taking the communion? Are you just trying to look good in front of the other saints? Right? Because you don't want them to think you did something. Okay? But examine yourself. Repent if you've done something. It's that simple. Just repent. Okay? Confess it to the Lord. The scripture says in 1 John uh, chapter 1, I believe it's around verse 8 and 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Somebody put that in the comments. Cleanse us from all sin. He does it. All unrighteousness is sin, okay? And he cleanses us from all of it, every bit of it, every trace of it. We're cleansed by the precious blood, oh, glory to his name, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We're cleansed, we're washed, we're made whole. And it's amazing the torture that Jesus went through for us to be free. The other night I was trying to fix our sink. I opened up our um, toolbox, a toolbox that we have. And somehow when I unlatched it, it pinched my hand. It pinched my hand. It didn't break the skin, but it, um, it created like a cut underneath the skin, if that makes sense. And I don't know if you can see, you can probably see it in the camera here this little piece here. So it's it didn't break the skin, but it formed like this blood underneath the skin. My point is that by itself hurt so badly. <laughs> I was like, mm. <laughs> okay, it was, I mean, it was painful. And, and, I, and I think about the fact that that's just a little tiny thing on my hand, okay? Jesus, had a horrible nail spike go through both hands and his feet and a crown of thorns placed on his head and a spear that went through his side. I mean, beyond your imagination, the pain, beyond your imagination, the, the agony that Jesus went through for us, beyond the uh, the shame that he endured on the cross, being stripped and put on the cross for everyone walking by and everyone observing to see and being crucified between two thieves. Okay, one on his right, one on his left. It's amazing what Jesus went through for us. And so Paul is saying, have this in mind when you take communion. Think about his sacrifice. Think about how much he loves us to the point that he sacrificed himself, was numbered with sinners, was numbered with criminals. As a matter of fact, a, a murderer and a robber was released, Barabbas. He was released in order for Jesus to go, to go to crucifixion because Pilate said, who shall I release to you? And they said, release Barabbas, crucify Jesus. Okay, and that was a symbol because Jesus went to the cross to free a murderer. Jesus went to the cross to free a thief and a robber, a liar, an insurrectionist. Jesus went to the cross for that person. So Jesus went to the cross for you and me. Whatever our sins may be, whatever our, our past failures and decisions and bad decisions and mistakes that we've made. He went to the cross for you and me. What great love, what great love he has for us. So he says, examine yourself. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. If you don't discern this, if you don't examine yourself, if you don't uh, eat and drink discerning the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking judgment, damnation, destruction to yourself. That is why he says, many of you are weak and ill and some have died. In other words, judgment came on these individuals who did not discern the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, 
who did not keep Jesus at the forefront of their thinking, okay? They went into judgment. They died, okay? Their lives were taken out as a act of judgment from the Lord, okay? So understand that illness, according to this scripture, weakness, infirmity, um, even death can be a judgment that is meted out because of our disobedience, okay? He says, but, and this is the good news, when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world, okay? So the saints do not get condemned along with the world. Jesus said, he that has passed, he that believes on him has passed from death unto life and will not come into condemnation, okay? So he's saying this judgment does not condemn you to hell, but it does bring judgment on you, okay? You're not condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another, okay? When you come together for this feast, when you come together for this agape feast, right, preceding the Lord's Supper, wait for one another. Don't dive in and eat up all the food and somebody else is, doesn't have enough to eat. Look out for one another. Verse 34, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. Okay, let him eat at home, the King James says, uh, that you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. So there was more that Paul needed to tell them, but he's saying uh, these other matters that were, that regards, you know, the Lord's Supper, I'm going to settle that when I come to visit you. Okay, so that's our study for tonight. I trust that has blessed you and given you some insight and knowledge and some more background and understanding of this scripture um, and giving some light and some illumination on the word of God. So we thank you for joining tonight. Please, at, by all means, if you would like to give, uh, please give. The ways to give are coming on the screen. There's Cash App, which is dollar sign R-I-V, L-I-V, water. That's Riv, live water. Um, there's also Givelify, which is rivers of living water. International Ministries, Church of God in Christ, that's C-O-G-I-C. You'll see our picture there. There's Zell. You can uh, use our handle, info, at riversoflivingwaterim.org. And of course, you can always mail us at the P.O. Box 2185, Belleville, Michigan, 48112. So we thank you for your sewing. We appreciate you greatly. And we look forward to seeing you on this coming Sunday. We are back in live, in person, 4.30 p.m., at 2455 Washtenaw Avenue. Join us every Sunday, okay? That's what we're doing for now until the Lord tells us differently. Join us every Sunday, 4.30 p.m. at 2455 Washtenaw Avenue in Ann Arbor, Michigan, 48104. Join us. We look forward to meeting with you, fellowshipping with you, loving on you, Amen. Looking out for your best interest. Amen. We don't want to be guilty of what the scripture was saying here of, uh, you know, not considering one another. OK, we need to be considerate of one another. This is something I'm working on every day in my own personal life, at home, at work, in the community, how to be considerate of others. So we look forward to meeting you on this Sunday. God bless and keep you. Lord, bless those who gave tonight and those who are willing to give. Lord God, even as we are giving as well, Lord, just let it cover a great space. Let it do uh, a great thing in your kingdom, oh God. Let it cause souls to be saved. Let these funds be used, oh God, for the building of your kingdom and for the reaching of the lost and the building up of the saints. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you on Sunday and see you again next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for Bible study. God bless you. Have a wonderful night.